Are you statin intolerant? Your doctor may not even believe that such a thing exists, but the medical establishment is catching on to it. The question is, how common is it? That's this week's topic. Stay tuned. When I was preparing this video, I consulted a lot of sources, and there's 10 of them listed here. The links to them will be in the description. A lot of these are secondary sources, and they kind of all come to the same conclusion, so I'm not going to reference all of them in this video, except for the bottom two, the ones in green here, and that is the National Lipid Association Scientific Statement on Statin Intolerance. The other one is a paper entitled Prevalence of Statin Intolerance, a Meta-Analysis, and it was reported in the European Heart Journal. So before we can answer the simple sounding question of how prevalent is statin intolerance, well, we have to understand what statin intolerance is. So here's a definition from that paper, the NLA Scientific Statement on Statin Intolerance, and that's a National Lipid Association. Statin intolerance is defined as one or more adverse effects associated with statin therapy, which resolves or improves with dose reduction. In other words, we show that it actually is because of the statin or discontinuation and can be classified as complete, which is the inability to tolerate any dose of a statin, or partial, which is the inability to tolerate a dose necessary to achieve the patient-specific therapeutic objective. That objective is usually a particular LDL level. In this video, we're not gonna argue about whether that's appropriate or not, we're just gonna go with it because we're talking about the definition of statin intolerance. What I like about this statement is not so much what it says, but what it doesn't say. Who decides whether the adverse effects are tolerable or not? The doctor doesn't decide. I have to assume that it's the patient who decides. And the patient says, no, I can't stand this dose of statins, doc. Therefore, the patient can be statin intolerant as long as you follow the rules and do like they say here, try a minimum of two different statins. And that is assuming the patient is keeping an open mind and assuming that they will actually be honest about whether the effects are tolerable or not. Don't just have an anti-statin bias, which usually comes from having true statin intolerance. So what contributes to statin intolerance? There are modifiable factors according to these two papers. Interesting the list here, diabetes, obesity, hypothyroidism, excessive use of alcohol, strenuous exercise. I have that capitalized because I'm gonna look a little deeper into that. Drug interactions and vitamin D deficiency. Interesting that they list diabetes as a modifiable factor. The medical profession is catching on to that. If you watch YouTube channels such as Beat Diabetes, you'll see that it is possible to actually reverse or put into remission at the very least diabetes. Obesity, yeah, there's things that we can do about that. From diet to things like bariatric surgery. Hypothyroidism, that would be an underactive thyroid. I'm sure there's medications that can deal with that. Excessive use of alcohol, yeah, as hard as it is, those can be cut back on. Drug interactions, the drugs that are interacting may be reduced or replaced or whatever. Vitamin D deficiency is an interesting one. I covered that in a previous video. A vitamin D deficiency is a contributing factor to whether you'll get statin-associated muscle symptoms, though the studies didn't show that treating the vitamin D deficiency with supplementation was actually effective in reducing the SAMs, the statin-associated muscle symptoms, but it's a factor that can be modified. Under factors that are not listed as modifiable is statin dose, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, and your demographics. You can't change your age. You can't change the genetics of your gender. You can't change your hereditary characteristics. Two interesting things here are the two that are capitalized. Statin dose, not modifiable. Well, statin dose certainly is modifiable, but in this context, what they mean is the statin dose that's necessary to achieve the lipid lowering, the LDL lowering that they want to achieve is not something that you can change. If it takes 40 milligrams of Crestor to lower your LDL to the level that they're trying to get you to, that's not something that you can change. Again, I'm not arguing about whether it's even appropriate to be trying to lower LDL, so bear with me on this. I am using their statistics sort of as a rhetorical device to just say, let's see where this leads us. A lot of times my viewers get upset if I'll say something about, well, you have a lipid lowering goal. It doesn't mean I believe in that goal, but I'm talking in terms of your doctor who does believe in that goal. So let's now look at strenuous exercise. They're saying that's a modifiable factor. Well, yeah, you can exercise less strenuously. So you're on this drug. You're intolerant of it because you exercise too strenuously. So the solution is going to be to reduce your exercise? That just doesn't make sense to me. So the question is, does strenuous exercise cause susceptibility to statin intolerance? Or do statins prevent the ability to exercise strenuously, thus leading to statin intolerance when strenuous exercise is attempted? In other words, do statins make us exercise intolerant? I think that was the case that happened with me. I wasn't able to complete my hikes. I've had videos on that. I can only do maybe 50 or 60 miles per hike. Now that I've gotten off stands, I'm able to complete hundreds and hundreds of miles per hike. 
So now let's get to the question of what is the prevalence? And it's gonna take us a couple minutes to get there. First here, some notes, statin intolerance, it's a subset of those people who have adverse effects. In other words, if the statin intolerance level is X percent, some greater number of people likely have statin adverse effects, but they can tolerate them. So statin intolerance is a subset of having adverse effects. And it was interesting, one of the papers referred to statin intolerance as being as high as 50%. And my initial reaction to that is, well, if it was really that high, it would be well known that this drug has that level of statin intolerance. But then I think about it and I say, a lot of people are getting off their statins and the medical community complains that it's 25 to 50% of people after one year. So maybe the statin intolerance is that high, but we're gonna go with the study papers and see what their figures are. Well, first, how do we figure that out? Well, there are randomized control trials and paper number nine, they pointed out this shortcoming of randomized control trials. The primary objective objectives of randomized control trials included in the meta-analysis are to assess clinical outcomes other than adverse effects and tolerability. So right there is the key to why RCTs aren't going to give us an accurate statin intolerance level. For these reasons, they give here self-selection of those who volunteer. I mean, if you know you're statin intolerant, you're not going to volunteer for, or you're going to drop out when you discover you are statin intolerant. It's difficult to take a randomized control trial and extract out of it some characteristic that it wasn't set up to study. Here are the examples of it. Not only will people with a prior statin intolerance not be involved, people with certain conditions that makes them statin intolerant. There's the run-in phases where they actually have people take it and then they decide after six weeks whether they're going to be, or whatever the period is, that they're going to be in the study or not. All these things suggest that results from clinical trials may produce an underestimation of the true incidence of statin intolerance. I actually object to the word suggestion. I think it means that the results from clinical trials, and strike the word may, which will say, it means that results from clinical trials produce an underestimation. Full stop right there. So they turn to observational or cohort studies. And in paper 10, they point this out. Prevalence of statin intolerance is widely debated. Okay, fine in part because of difficulties in identification and diagnosis because the definitions aren't always followed. I mean, how do you even gather the data? How do you decide whether somebody's statin intolerant or not? They go on to say, in contrast with the RCTs where the prevalence is usually measured five to 7%, cohort studies suggest that statin intolerance may be as much as 30%. And that to me seems actually kind of reasonable, but we're gonna give fair play to what these papers actually determine in the end. So here are the conclusions. Well, from paper number nine, they actually didn't reach a conclusion specifically. At the beginning of the paper, they said, well, statin intolerance is reported to be between five and 30%. And under the heading, how prevalent is statin intolerance? They ended up in the concluding paragraph saying it's somewhere between five and 30%. So they really didn't get anywhere, but this little gem was in there. They did say that estimates of prevalence from observational cohort data, which was 17%, may more accurately reflect the real world clinical experience. They have that figure. So I'm just gonna say 17%, they said it was between five and 30, 17% seems to be a reasonable number to say that's kind of what they came up with. Paper 10 was actually more specific. They outright stated the overall prevalence of statin intolerance is 9.1%. Very interesting how precise that number is, 9.1%, not 9.2, not 9.0, 9.1%. So there's false precision there, but we'll take that as the lower bound. Okay, so what are the consequences of knowing what the statin tolerance is? Well, whether the prevalence is 9% or 17%, there's millions of cases of statin intolerance worldwide as a result of that. Now, I don't have the figures for the world as a whole, but in the United States, there are about 92 million people on statins, or at least who have been prescribed statins. So if nine to 17% of those people are statin intolerant, that's somewhere between 8 million and 15 million people who are statin intolerant. So when your doctor tells you it's all nocebo effect, there are no adverse effects from statins, just show them one of these papers and say, hey, if you're gonna accept scientific literature in the scientific reports, then you should be accepting this. It's not 0%. It is somewhere between one in 11 and one in six people, and that's a lot. But what's gonna happen is doctors, family members, and internet trolls will tell you it's all in your mind if you claim statin intolerance, or even if you say you have statin adverse effects. So why does that matter to us other than the insult from the doctor? Let's look at paper 10 and one of the things that they said here, because statins are the gold standard for the treatment of dyslipidemia and in the management of elevated cardiovascular risk, the most important issue during the diagnosis and management of patients with statin intolerance is the urgent need to continue statin therapy. 
I read that and my first thought was this. Well, why isn't the most important issue the urgent need to protect patients with statin intolerance from harms of statins? Statin intolerance is more than just, oh, I can't tolerate these adverse effects. Some of them are deadly. Some of them absolutely destroy quality of life and sometimes they're not recoverable. The urgent need to me is to protect patients with statin intolerance from the harms of statins. Finally, they throw this little tidbit out. This was right after they reported that it was a 9.1% statin intolerance level. Clinicians should use these results to encourage adherence to statin therapy in the patients they treat. So in other words, you're going to tell all your patients, only one out of 11 patients or only one out of six patients, whichever it is, is actually statin intolerant. So therefore, you should continue to take statins because it's not possible that you'd be one of those one out of 11 people. It's not possible that you're in a group of 8 million Americans, for example, who are statin intolerant. Be a good boy. Be a good girl. Keep taking your statins. So that's the bottom line we have here. One paper reported that statin intolerance was between 5% and 30%. They started with that and they ended with that, but it seemed like they did have a good justification for saying it's around 17%. Another paper said it's 9%. In either case, it's millions of us. And there's probably a higher percentage among my viewers because most of my viewers are watching this channel because they've had experiences that would lead us to believe that we're statin intolerant. So that's what I've got on this topic. If you appreciate this content, please like, share, subscribe, and comment on this topic or others you'd like me to cover. And if you haven't seen this video, I recommend you take a look at it now. Thanks for listening.